GOPAC Chairman David Avella. Good morning. It has been GOPAC's mission since 1978 to build a roster of Republicans who are ready to lead in their state legislatures and get prepared to run for higher office. It is through our called up program that last year we were pleased to be part of Senator Joni Ernst's impressive victory in Iowa, Senator Cory Gardner's campaign in Colorado, Senator Tom Tillis's campaign in North Carolina. And it's equally important that GOPAC is working to spread conservative ideas across the land through state legislatures and allow state legislators to get together to trade best practices and share conservative ideas. And this morning, we have a treat for you that we're going to bring four of our emerging leaders to talk with you about ideas that they're work, working to champion. So please welcome to the stage Virginia State Senator Bryce Reeves, <laughs> Oklahoma State Senator David Holt, Oklahoma State Senator Stephanie Bice, and Tennessee State Senator Mark Green. Senator Reeves is a former Army Ranger and an insurance agent, and his freshman year got elected the majority whip of the Virginia Senate. Virginia has their state Senate elections, and Bryce represents the most Democrat district held by a Republican. He has... A which that honor now makes him the number one target of the Democrats as they seek to pick up one seat. <laughs> Governor McAuliffe has pledged he will raise whatever he has to to beat Bryce Reeves. To learn more about Bryce Reeves, please visit www.brycereeves.com. And welcome to the podium, Senator Bryce Reeves. Thank you. Well, good morning. It's, uh, it's good to be number one at something, David. So <laughs> number one on the uh, Democrats' radar is not a bad thing. But uh, good morning, Oklahoma, and thank you for having me here. Uh, I love Oklahoma. I grew up in Texas and found my way out to Virginia. I always tell people I'm my greatest political uh, person I try to look to for guidance is Sam Houston. And people say, Sam Houston? And I'm like, well, he was a Virginian who became a Texan, and I really am a Texan who became a Virginian. So, <laughs> But, uh, you know, as a man of faith, I... Um, I rely on my faith quite often, and this morning I was in my devotion time before David and I proceeded down to the gym, and Ephesians 4.25 came up, and that was my verse today, and it says, Wherefore, putting away falsehood, speak ye truth each one with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And so today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the truth that I see in America from my point of view in the Virginia legislature, and I stand resolute on the idea that with a clear vision and the right leadership, America can and will be the greatest country in the world again. And we've kind of slid, and we all know that. And putting it together in my mind, the events that kind of led to where we are today and why 2016 is so critical to us. You see, Republicans are not just the maintainers of the status quo, but we must be the creators of the future generations, the future of where we're headed. Because Americans and the ones that I've served with in uniform, and, and Mark will talk about this as well, are forward-looking, they're very optimistic. And for some reason, we've kind of had this cloud haze over us about where we're headed. But we must have a vision that our founding fathers had. They had it, and it was really simple, that we must remain one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all, not just the 99%, not just the 1%, but all. That's a defining term, all, as in whole, the whole body. You see, we have a, a duty. We have to be the compass bearers for our children and lead them on a pathway to success to tomorrow. You know, as parents and as a parent of a 17-year-old and a 12-year-old, that's the greatest responsibility I have. And so when I work in the General Assembly, I'm, I'm constantly thinking 
of my kids. And I also know that it's not just a duty, but it's a moral obligation that we have as parents. And we can't lose what we're doing there. Reagan himself even said that we are one generation away from relinquishing our freedoms if we don't maintain it, put a vigilance and a watch on that. And that watch has to be held by leadership. Leadership. Our greatest days ahead must be focused on bringing America back to greatness. Leadership that many of my colleagues seated on this, this dais today deal with day in and day out. I'm proud to say in Virginia we balance our budget each and every year down to the penny. But it's becoming very difficult for us to do that, looking to Washington for solutions when all we find are problems and more regulations. And, and Washington consistently, and I'm in Virginia, I represent a, a place about an hour south of Washington, D.C., and all we see is them trampling on our Constitution and our state's rights. The rest of the world looks to America for refuge, for protection. And in my mind, I go back to what it is that we're lacking. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. You see, you and I together, we have to be that next group of leadership. I, I, I enjoy GOPAC so much because I get to hang out with Quad A leaders who have a vision for their states and they see a direction and they set the pathway forward. But ultimately, we have to be responsible for what we do going forward for this country as Republicans. And in order for us to move America forward, we really have to look to her past, to her history. And history has shown us that we cannot continue to add more and more debt. I was listening to the last presentation and they were talking about what's important in the economy. I think it was John Adams who said it best when he said, there are two ways to conquer a country. One is by the sword, which is force, and the other by debt. John Adams, one of our founding fathers that long ago, knew what the pathway to prosperity would be. So how do we do it? So how do we get out of this quagmire that we're in right now that we find ourselves, and that as legislators we deal with on a daily basis? So how do we protect this growing prosperity that they talked about in the last briefing? We have to put together packages and incentives to help small business and entrepreneurs and get rid of these regulations that tie the hands of small business. As a small business owner myself, it's one of the things that got me engaged in politics. And see, that's the challenge that we have. Until it affects you personally, most people don't get engaged. They spend 5% of their time in politics. You know, the other thing I want to talk just a little bit about, and I'm, I'm trying to, to stay on time, Hack, but I'm passionate, as you can see, about some of the things, is that when I watch the news and I watch it with my kids, I see it in their face, that fear, that anguish, when they watch what's happening to our men and women in uniform. You see, we have a determined enemy that wants to kill our men and women in uniform. They want to blow up our citizens. And they want to do as much evil as they can to our country and abroad. But we can't sit around and respond with a measured response. We have to take bold action. When you say draw a line in the sand, a red line in the sand, you need to mean it. As we get ready to, to ramp up to 2016, David briefly mentioned it, uh, you're not going to win Virginia or the presidency without coming through Virginia. We do have a difficult race this year. We have to hold the Senate where, uh, where I serve. But I would ask each of you in this, uh, this body today to really reflect back and figure out what it is, what it is about America that makes us great and that's missing, and what it is that you need from us that serve you what are we doing? What are we not doing? But really what I want to ask you is, what are you willing to do to make America great again? I know what we're doing and what my family's plans are, and I know what Dr. Green's plans are and the rest of my colleagues on this dais, but what are you willing to do? 
Ronald Reagan, I had the opportunity uh, through GOPAC, which was an amazing experience, to go see the Reagan Ranch. And, and David says it quite often, if you want to know Ronald Reagan, you want to know his policies, you go to the library. If you want to know the heart of the man, you go to the ranch. And Reagan believed this, and I wholeheartedly believe it, that we, we as Americans, that's a great word to say, right? We as Americans have the opportunity to stand for something, for freedom, for fairness, and for liberty, and for liberty. And these are the things worth fighting for, worth devoting our very lives to. So we have good cause to be optimistic in the Sooner State. We, us, all of us, must be the happy warriors out to take back our country in 2016 and no longer be defenders of the status quo, but set America up for a bright future. You all, thank you so much. God bless. Godspeed. Oklahoma born, Oklahoma raised, still an Oklahoman. <laughs> the former chief of staff to Mayor Mick Cornett and a rising star on the national scene as David talks about the role Republicans must play in our inner cities and us becoming a more viable party in areas where maybe we haven't done so well lately. You can, visit, you can learn more about David at VoteDavidHolt.com. Welcome to the podium, David Holt. Thank you. Now, I was told I didn't have to stand at the podium. For really tall guys like me, it's easier to just stand out here. Can you see me? Okay, great. Well, good morning. Oh, I know you can do better than that. You're Republicans. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, Welcome to Oklahoma City, for those of you who are out of town. As David said, uh, born and raised here, my hometown, it's Senator Bice's hometown. We're thrilled to have you here. It's a big event for us, uh, and we're proud to show off Oklahoma City, not the least of which is because this city has been governed by a Republican mayor for 27 years. Yeah. And what I'm, some of the data I'm going to share with you in a minute is going to make you really understand why you should, you should probably give that a standing ovation, because it is very unique to have Republican mayors. And to, and to put that first into perspective, I want to remind us of the successes we're having at other levels of government. Uh, you know, obviously we know we've taken Congress. That's exciting. We've got 70% of the state legislative bodies in our nation. We've got over 30 of the governorships. It's a great time to be a Republican. However, do you know how many of the top 100 metropolitan areas in the United States, how many of those are governed, their central city is governed by a Republican mayor, out of 100? 15, okay? The Green Party considers that political relevance, <laughs> but we deserve better than that. 15 out of 100. And you know, there are warning signs, even in Oklahoma. In Oklahoma City, where we sit now, in 2014, our governor was reelected by a pretty good margin. The Democrat got 41% in the state. I don't think that's anything to write home about, but he ran even with her here in Oklahoma City, the biggest city and the fastest growing city in our state. So these are things I, I, I want you to, if I leave you with nothing else today, I want you to be thinking about um, this issue because you know living in a city is not exactly a, a niche thing in American life today. That top 100 metros I just mentioned, okay, where 85% where are governed by a Democrat, those top 100 metros represent two thirds of the population of the United States of America. 212 million people live in, the, in those combined top 100 metros. And most of them, as I said, look up and they see a Democrat providing their community's vision, their community's core services. And this is a, this is a missed opportunity on multiple levels. I mean, first of all, we're, we're not strategically putting ourselves in position to do well at other levels of government if we're not doing well at the lowest level of government that's closest to the people. Have you ever heard that famous saying, it, it might be apocryphal, but Willie Sutton, the bank robber, was once asked, why do you rob banks? And he said, because that's where the money is, right? <laughs> There's actually, they, 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 theorists have turned this into a, a thing. They call it the Sutton theory, right? That, that sometimes the, most, the simplest explanation is the right one. So, well, I guess the corollary to that here in, in, in politics is, why should you want to compete in cities? Because that's where the voters are. 
That's where people live. And we're not being competitive there. So there's a strategic benefit, obviously, to, to demonstrating our excellence in government at that level. But it's also just a, a, a terribly missed opportunity. This is the level of government we're best at. We believe in a limited core government, okay? What are the things that cities do? They, they bring you water, they pick up your trash, they, pro they build your roads, they provide you police and fire protection. You know, these are core services. And then they get out of the way, at least the good ones do. That's what we as Republicans believe in. Bring you the core government services that only government could or should provide, and then get out of the way. We believe in other things that are really effective at the city level, you know? We believe in standing against um, overreaching government unions. We believe in school choice. You know, these are things that we could do really well if given the chance. And you know who are the most successful Democratic mayors? The ones who get reelected and get, get thrown up for, for national office? It's the ones who do those things, who cut budgets, stand against the unions, stand for school choice. The best Democratic mayors are the ones who govern like Republicans. We're ceding an entire level of government to our opposition. And so that's what I want to leave you with today. You know, we're, we all stand up here as four rising stars. Well, to, be, to, to eventually rise, we've got to have a party that's viable at all levels of government, all parts of the country, all demographics, minorities, women, young people. And to do that, we've got to compete in the cities. And so uh, for us to realize our potential as leaders, I'm asking your help to prioritize that in the future. Think about that issue, about, about the lack of competitiveness that we currently have in municipal government here in America. It's not something that gets talked about enough. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for all that you individually do, either here in Oklahoma or in your communities that you've come from. Uh, to help the Republican Party. We deeply appreciate it. And again, enjoy your time in Oklahoma City. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good job. David. You, David. David mentions that to grow our party, our party's leaders have to be as diverse as our Republican Party is. And we are fortunate today to have with us Senator Stephanie Bice, who ran for office because she very passionately wants to make sure that her children get to live here in Oklahoma when they get older. And she wants to make sure there's job opportunities here in Oklahoma so people can support their families. And Stephanie just got elected in November, but she has already become a go-to voice in the Oklahoma Senate on creating a playing field in Oklahoma where people who want to pursue opportunities and create jobs can do that. You can learn more about her at stephaniebice.com. Welcome to the podium, Oklahoma Senator Stephanie Bice. I am not tall like Senator Holt, so I will use the podium here. Uh, thank you for the introduction. As David mentioned, I'm a business executive. And even though women have ascended to high leadership positions in many fields, including business, law, and medicine, there is still a lack of equal representation in politics. And it is my goal to change that. I am joined here by an elite group of young legislators who make up the GOPAC Emerging Leaders, of which is uh, how I'm privileged to speak to you today. Of the 22 members of the 2015 Emerging Leaders class, only six are women. In state and national legislatures, women hold only a small percentage of seats, making up about one-fourth of all state legislators nationwide, yet we're slightly more than half the population. We as the Republican electorate play an important role in bringing about parity and closing the gender gap in American politics, and not just for women, but Republican women. Young women do have strong role models from which to learn. A perfect example is our own Governor Mary Fallon. <laughs> Governor Fallon worked in the private sector and was frustrated by the red tape and regulations businesses had to endure, and she wanted to change it. As a freshman female minority member of the legislature, she worked across party lines and managed to pass the state's first anti-stalking legislation and only the second in the entire country. 
She went on to be the first women lieutenant governor for the state of Oklahoma, only the second female uh, elected to Congress from Oklahoma, and the first female governor of the state of Oklahoma. <laughs> Then there's a local young woman who is standing up for change in Stevens County, Oklahoma. At the age of 22, Hope Sutterfield is believed to be the youngest county GOP chair currently serving in all 77 counties in the state. <laughs> About seven years ago, Sutterfield visited DC with her family. And at just 13, she decided she would become the change she wanted to see in the world. Over the last few years, Sutterfield has been involved in campaigns in Stevens County and says even at that level, she can make a difference. These are just two examples of strong women in leadership. There are others, but there should be more. A primary reason there are far fewer women in elected office than men is because fewer women put themselves forward as candidates. Studies show that factors inhibiting women from running for office include feeling uh, unqualified to serve, not understanding the process of running, and needing to be asked repeatedly to run before they seriously consider launching a campaign. Instead of working behind the scenes, women need to come out in front and lead. <laughs> We need to start changing that dynamic at a young age by encouraging our daughters and the other young women to run for office. Political involvement can start by running for student government in high school or in college. In order for young women to be, aspire to be political leaders, they need to see women who are successfully elected officials. Take your daughters with you to town hall meetings. Visit the Capitol and talk to legislators who represent you and any other opportunity that they can watch women leaders in action. We need organizations like the Republican Federation of Women to seek, <laughs> to seek out young women and bring them up in the party, not just to serve on the campaigns of others, but to look towards leadership positions in their communities, then onto the House and the Senate on local and even national levels. Recruitment and encouragement can lead many who thought otherwise would have never considered running for office to emerge as candidates, and I am the perfect example of that. In a study by the School of Public Affairs at American University, it was found this type of encouragement to serve is one of the strongest predictors of political ambition. But they also found that women were less likely than men to receive that support. That can change with us, all of us, beginning today. I have just five minutes to speak to you, not nearly enough time. This is the only the beginning of a conversation on how to change the political ambition of Republican women. It is a start in how we, as conservatives, men and women, can make our party the one in which women are bold and strong and hold leadership positions. I am proud to live in this prosperous and free country I am proud to represent the great state of Oklahoma. I look forward to the day when more elected officials, female elected officials, are standing next to me on this stage. If the party does not mirror our population, the Republican Party runs the risk of being viewed as excluding. The task of increasing female representation in politics is within reach. Let us work together to achieve that. Thank you. Senator Mark Green is also a doctor. One of his most notable patients is Saddam Hussein when he was the military doctor who examined Saddam Hussein when they pulled him out of the hole. When, if you want to know more about that, you can read his book, A Night with Saddam. To learn more about Mark Green, you can go to markgreenfortennessee.com. Welcome to the podium, Tennessee State Senator Mark Green.
Well, as David said, I got to be the first doctor uh, working with some special operations guys to go into Baghdad. And my first job when I got there was to find a vehicle in the event that any of these guys got wounded. And uh, I started looking around the airfield and I found this Nissan pickup truck and I thought this will be perfect. So I began to hotwire the truck. Now, I'm not some criminal, okay? They teach you how to do this in special operations. But as I'm hotwiring the truck, this guy with a huge beard comes up. He grabs me and spins me around. And let me just ask, has anybody here ever stolen a car? Anybody? <laughs> well, I don't know about you guys, but I thought I was going to lose my head that night. But he quickly told me the agency of our federal government that he worked for and that he'd already stolen that truck. That was his truck. <laughs> So I, I mope away thinking I've got to tell the SEAL team commander I failed in my mission and uh, then I, I, you know, he, I guess, felt sorry for me and sent me down to the end of the runway where there was this powder blue Nissan Maxima. I hopped in and had the keys in the ignition. I hit the keys, nothing happened. Somebody had stolen the battery. So I'm walking away and uh, I, I head back and I see that the agency's got, guy is gone and so I, I look left, I look right. Nissan Maxima, Nissan truck, I stole the guy's battery. <laughs> and uh, it was a perfect fit. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. Some months later, I'm in the post exchange and in walks the bearded agency guy. He made a beeline straight to me. He said, buddy, did you steal my battery that night we came into Baghdad? And I said, yes, sir, I did. He said, no worries. I'd taken it out of that Nissan Maxima I sent you down to go get. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. It's great to see you, Oklahoma, and all the others from all across the south, southern U.S. We love you, and thanks for being here. Thanks for fighting for conservative values. You know, our health care system, I'm here to present an idea on health care. Uh, we're, we're kind of in trouble. You know, if you look at the three biggies, uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and Social Security, they'll exasperate the entire revenue of the federal government by 2060. That means no roads, no defense department, no EPA, I guess there's a silver lining in it after all, right? Um, we can't afford to add anybody to the roles of our health care system. It would be financial suicide. If the price of something is zero, economics tells us there's no end to the demand, meaning there's no supply that will ever meet the demand. That means a shortage. And if you want to understand what that's about, go to the Veterans Administration. It's sad, but unfortunately, we're not taking very good care of those guys. But it's all the economics of health care. A lot of people seem to think that a copay will fix it, but let me tell you, a copay won't fix the problem. The third party payer system masks the price and doesn't allow for a market based price. And even the copay doesn't work. I run a healthcare foundation, and we were sending docs to Cambodia. They went to get their shots, and the uh, major medical center was going to charge 750 bucks. Now, this is not for profit dollars we've had to raise. My guys call me and say, Mark, 750, and I say, no way. I call around. It's 150 at this other hospital. But if the copay was 50 bucks here or 50 bucks here, who shops? Who wastes time looking for a better price? The copay doesn't work to create a free market that will incentivize people to save and shop for price. Can a free market work in healthcare? Absolutely it can. Look at LASIK eye surgery. LASIK eye surgery when it came out was $6,000 an eye and now it's $600 an eye. Despite the fact that medical inflation has grown at twice the rate of, of standard inflation, a laser that shaves microns off your cornea goes from 6,000 bucks to 600 bucks. And at that market price, guess what? The ophthalmologists, they're doing just fine. The best thing that's ever worked to decrease health care consumption, to decrease health care consumption is health savings accounts. In 2011, they did a study on HSAs and an 11 to 12 percent decrease in consumption of health care happened for people in HSAs. So the question becomes, how do we save money in health care, create a market force that actually drives price and helps those people that we're trying to help, incentivizes those people we're trying to help, on Medicaid, save money, shop for price. Well, I think there's a way to do it. And uh, I've proposed Senate Joint Resolution 88 in the Tennessee Senate. Imagine this, a uh, 
health care plan, catastrophic health care plan, where the Medicaid patient is given a swipe card with one-third the dollars we'd normally spend, about 1200 bucks. We hand them the card, and then we say, you can use this at the doctor's office that's credentialed with Medicaid. You, you can use it at the pharmacy. But whatever money you haven't spent, at the end of the year, you get back as an earned income credit. These patients don't understand a health savings account, but they get an earned income credit. Imagine a health care system, Medicaid system, where they're incentivized to save, they're incentivized to shop for price. They're incentivized to take care of their health so they get more revenue back. And the state is saving enormous amounts of money. Imagine a physician who gets paid immediately when the card is swiped. He doesn't have to file claims. He's incentivized to take more Medicaid patients. We've got to do something. Because in this nation, we can't borrow money to pay our tithe. And that's what we're trying to do. And this EBT system will allow us to save money and maybe even insure a few more people. Thank you for having us here today. Thank you, Dr. Would you agree that the Republican Party's hands are in good, we are in good hands with these four leaders as emerging leaders? Because of you, Republicans now are the majority in 69 of 99 state legislative chambers. <laughs> to help put that in perspective, you can go from Texas up to Wisconsin, over to Pennsylvania, down to Florida, and only the Kentucky House has a majority of Democrats. We, get we hope you will continue supporting this mission. Getting active in GoPack. You can follow us at gopack.org. You can follow us on Twitter at GoPack. You can follow us on Facebook at GoPack. Thank you for all you do. We look forward to working with you to educate and elect a new generation of Republican leaders. Thank you. Thank you.